Hello, welcome. I've titled this video, Before We Begin, Five Things You Should Know When Starting Land Law. Of course, there are probably 105 things you should know when starting land law. So why have I called it five things? Well, having taught land law for several years now, I notice year on year certain aspects or things that students typically misunderstand or struggle to grasp, certainly at the outset of the course. And I have a bit of a theory that if you as students could grasp and appreciate these five core aspects at the outset of the course, it really will put you on track for success in this subject. There's really no point delving into deep academic debates or jumping into the complexities of the law or the minutiae of the law if you don't understand these five fundamental foundational ideas or distinctions. This way of just delving in without grasping these could mean that you start on the wrong foot and end up just not enjoying the subject. So in this short video, I offer the five things you should know uh, before you start land law, in my view. In actual fact, these are themes that will run through the entirety of your land law course and you really cannot understand and thrive in the subject without them. I've very much been inspired, hopefully as the title of this video should give you a clue, I've been inspired by Peter Burke's wonderful piece called Before We Begin, Five Keys to Land Law. It's well worth the read and Burke starts his piece by saying, and I agree with this, that land law may be a complex subject, but it's not a difficult one. The issue really is getting into the subject. And I very much agree with him. The issue is one of access, accessing the subject. And my hope in this video is that by focusing on just five core ideas, it will aid your access to land law. So I'm sure you're dying to know what those five are. So let's get into it. The first is the personal property divide or the personal proprietary divide. This really is central to understanding of land law. In land, we are concerned with real property, rights in rem, as we sometimes call them, as opposed to rights in personam. Well, what does all this mean? Well, think of the examples of, for example, owning a car and owning a house. The rights we have in relation to the car are personal rights. Another example of that would be contractual rights. Yet if we say we own a home, they are real property rights. They are rights in rem. And what's the significance of this, of this distinction between personal and proprietary? Well, if the house falls into the hands of another and you have rights over that property, you can enforce your rights against that new owner. In other words, this divide is crucial in terms of against whom can I enforce my rights? Property rights are not only capable of being enforced against those original parties to the transaction, but against third parties also. So rights in REM, property rights, are capable of binding third parties. Rights in personam are only capable, in most cases, of binding the parties that originally created those personal rights. So this personal proprietary divide is the first key idea that you need to grasp if you're going to really get to grips with land law. What's the second one? Well, I'd call this understanding the duality of law and equity. What do I mean by that? Well, the common law courts and the court of equity or the chancery court developed historically separately. They are now, of course, fused. So there is only one court. But a crucial hangover or inheritance from this historical development is that in land law, we need to think about whether rights, property rights, are legal or equitable. Property rights can be both. So um, now that the systems of law and equity are fused, um, how do we think about this distinction between law and equity? Well, often we think about legal rights as being stronger rights more powerful rights, and equitable rights as being weaker. Now, it's true that most people would, for example, rather have a legal right, a legal property right, than an equitable one. But why is that? 
Well, quite simply, equitable rights arise more informally and are more vulnerable to losing enforceability. And essentially, with equitable rights, you have to do much more, take more positive steps to protect them. You'll learn much more about this in your landlord course. As Burks explains in his work, this is the price you have to pay, this vulnerability of equitable rights. This is the price you have to pay for equity's more informal, relaxed approach to the creation of rights. So look out during your course for this distinction between law and equity. And if you can start your course knowing that there is this duality, then that will stand you in good stead. What's next? Well, the next idea is the idea of estates and interests. Often I find students uh, muddle the two or don't really understand the difference. One way of thinking about estates is that land law facilitates dealings in slices of time. These slices of time are known as estates. At law today, there are only two recognised legal estates. In other words, there can only ever be, at law, two types of legal estate. Freehold, sometimes called the fee simple, that's the closest we have to ownership, outright ownership of land, and the leasehold estate, more commonly known as a lease or a tenancy. Many of you will be very familiar with that concept of a tenancy. So why do estates matter? Well, all land in England and Wales is vested in the Crown, Individuals cannot own, per se, land. So when we say, I own my own home, what we actually mean is, I own a slice of time in that land. I own an estate in the land. That means I have the right to use, enjoy, and control the land for that particular period of time. And this is where land law really is magic. This is the magic of the subject because a parcel of land can hold multiple interests at the same time. So there could be a, for example, freehold estate, there could be carved out of that a leasehold estate, and beneath that there is then a whole array, potentially, of smaller rights, lesser rights, that are operating on that estate. And we call these smaller or lesser rights interests, proprietary interests. They include things such as rights of way, also known as easements, rights restricting how land is used, restrictive covenants, and many others that you'll cover in your land law courses. So be sure not to confuse estates and interests when approaching land law. Note that hierarchy. I've actually put a diagram in my textbook about this, with estates at the top, slices of time, underneath that, proprietary interests, and at the very bottom of our hierarchy, interests which are not proprietary at all, for example, personal licences. What's our next uh, issue to consider of the five? Well, it's registered and unregistered land. It sounds very straightforward, but students regularly muddle registered and unregistered land. They are two separate systems and must be kept distinct. Essentially, they have different rules. And therefore, it's important that you can distinguish between the two. It's very common for students to underplay the significance of whether land is registered or unregistered, or fail to note the status of the land uh, in a problem question, for example. And as a result, you take a wrong turn. So from the outset of your course, do look out for whether land is registered or unregistered. Well, why does it matter? Well, it matters because there are different rules on the priority or enforceability of interests in land. Different statutory provisions apply. Different statutes apply in some cases. So, for example, registered land is governed largely by the Land Registration Act 2002, whereas unregistered land is governed by the Law of Property Act 1925 and the Land Charges Act 1972, as well as other principles. So whether land is registered or unregistered will take you down a particular path for your analysis. So keep the two separate. Just very briefly, what is registered land? It means land whose title has been recorded or registered at Land Registry, Her Majesty's Land Registry. 
essentially means there's a record of the land, there's a title number has been given. And if land is sold, for example, then the new purchaser is registered, recorded at land registry as the new owner. There are all sorts of other consequences and rules which you'll study as part of your land law course. Today, 86% of titles to land in England and Wales are registered, leaving just 14% unregistered. And unregistered then, land then is simply land whose title is not recorded at land registry. And they're governed, uh, unregistered land is governed by quite different rules. For example, legal rights in unregistered land are almost always universally enforceable. And we have a separate and narrow system of land charges registration, which applies in unregistered land. So lots of other rules and different rules applying there. A key confusion then for students with land law is muddling whether land is unregistered or registered. Focus on that distinction, check that question if you've got one in front of you, make sure you keep them separate in your mind. And our final point, the, the, the fifth issue that I want to raise with you, which I think is key to consider before you start a land law course or as you're starting to get to grips with the subject, is this. Land law is not all about soil, earth, bricks and mortar. Land is much more than that. Land is special and unique and permanent. And this is really the point. Land is actually, and land law, is about power. And as I stress in my introduction to my textbook, it's about relationships. It's often overlooked and worth therefore appreciating from the start of the course that power has a big part to play. Land is valuable financially and non-financially. So who has rights in land is crucial. Kevin and Susan Gray have discussed, for example, at length, the fragility of the concept of property. They've noted that few concepts are as elusive as the concept of property. And property has built within it uh, a sense of status, perhaps acceptability for those who have property rights, but also built within it power struggles between different parties, stronger parties, weaker parties, for example. And this is reflected throughout the course uh, of land law. And you should keep returning to this concept, I would argue, of relationships and how the law balances relationships within this subject. There's no clearer example, I don't think, of the value-laden nature of property and the concept of property than uh, slavery. And if we think about slavery as an example, slaves were regarded as the property of their slave masters. Now today, to us, this is absolutely appalling, but what it does is demonstrate, I think, the potency, the power struggles that have long been at the heart of property and this idea of something being yours, mine, and the battles that flow and the conflicts that flow from this concept of property. Another example, something that I've done in my own research, think about homelessness and the connotations of homelessness, of the marginalisation and othering felt by the homeless simply because they have no home, no property, nowhere to live. Again, shows you the power of property and uh, essentially the social element that sits at the heart of this subject. What we see then is property is about power, power over things. And this is socially and spatially constructed. How is this relevant to studying land law? Well, because land is so special and unique, who owns what? Whose rights take priority if there is a battle between one party's rights and another is very important. It's not just about money, it's about more than that, it's about power. And land law therefore springs from relationships. And a final example should make this point. Think of the relationship between the landlord and the landlord's tenant. Many of you may be in that relationship now. You may be, for example, 
in a student uh, flat, a student property with a private landlord. The law surrounding leasehold and the land law has sought to balance the interests of both parties. So rights and responsibilities on both sides. And it's for you, I suppose, throughout this course, course to consider if the law has struck the right balance in the relationships between people and land. Those are my five uh, things that I think you should be thinking about at the outset of your land law course. And all I would say is I hope that's been useful and that you can return to these. Certainly these are key themes that will crop up as you continue through your journey with land law.